Billionaires, bankers and bureaucrats converge on the Swiss town of Davos. Under discussion, creating a sustainable global economy. But is a capitalist-focused cabal the best venue for fighting the climate crisis? I'm Maria Ramos and today's newsmaker is the 2020 World Economic Forum. The idea of the world's elite private jetting into an exclusive Swiss ski resort to discuss ways to save the planet and build a more equitable global economy might seem a bit hypocritical. Uh, infamously exclusive, the Davos Summit attracts everyone from CEOs to celebrities tackling subjects as diverse as cryptocurrency and quantum computing. And this year is no different. But what is different is the theme, which essentially boils down to capitalism with a conscience. But do the titans of industry who've gathered in the heart of the Alps really care about protecting the environment or because not doing it threatens their business? Adam Pletz has this report. The World Economic Forum is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Each year, CEOs, politicians and billionaires gather in Davos, in the Swiss Alps, to discuss how business can contribute to a better world. Or at any rate, that's the idea. What the forum calls stakeholder capitalism. The aims this year are to assist governments in working towards the UN's sustainable development goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. Now we are faced with an urgency. We see a window uh, for action closing. And that's the reason why we put so much emphasis on the issue of climate uh, during this 50th anniversary. And we put the emphasis not only in words, but in action. But many critics say the forum and its elite participants are part of the problem, not the solution to the climate crisis. We have an alliance that is organizing next week in 30 countries to say time is up to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Time is up. It is time to abolish billionaires. The World Economic Forum organizers and most of its participants accept the urgency of the climate crisis. But US President Donald Trump, who pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement in 2017, struck a very different tone. This is not a time for pessimism. This is a time for optimism. Fear and doubt is not a good thought process because this is a time for tremendous hope and joy and optimism and action. But to embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. He pledged the U.S. will join a U.N. initiative to plant one million trees, but his critics say such measures do not tackle the root causes of the climate crisis. We're not telling you to offset your emissions by just paying someone else to plant trees in places like Africa, while at the same time forests like the Amazon are being slaughtered at an infinitely higher rate. Planting trees is good, of course, but it's nowhere near enough of what is needed, and it cannot replace real mitigation and rewilding nature. Proponents say Davos's strength is its ability to bring divergent voices together and allow activists to speak truth under power. But are their words being heard? And will it result in any real action? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. Let's go to Davos, where this year's World Economic Forum is taking place. And joining me is Rachel Kite, who's the Dean of Tufts University's Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And she's also the former CEO and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. Also joining us is Rupert Reed, the spokesman for Extinction Rebellion and the author of This Civilization is Finished. 
Thank you both for joining us on the Newsmakers. Now, you're both climate experts and you are both there at Davos. Uh, Rachel, can Davos actually move the needle with regards to inequality and the climate crisis? Well, I, I'm always sceptical when I arrive in Davos, but I have to say this year is different. It's more sober. Uh, it's more disciplined. The meetings that I'm in, which are meetings on energy and heavy industry, the difficult things to decarbonize, people are um, serious. People are a little bit humble. Humility is not a concept that you often used to find here. And so I do think that... Uh, the message is beginning to, to get in, to, to sink in. And the message is coming from investors and the message is coming from Greta and from other kids all over the world um, asking their fathers and mothers when they come home from work, what are you doing now that you know how bad the crisis is? Rupert, would you agree this year is different? So this is the first time I've come to Davos. I travelled uh, by train, unlike some of the participants here. I'm struck by the fact that, yes, there's a lot of talk about the right issues. But look, there's a lot of problems with the setup here at Davos. Can it really make any sense to have all these people flying in by private jet to supposedly tell the world how to become more sustainable? I think the organizers of Davos, if this is going to continue, this, this organization in future years, should ask themselves questions like, well, what about if we had a virtual event instead? What about if we had an event where it was required that people didn't take flights to get here? However challenging that should be, perhaps there should be more different World Economic Forums in different parts of the world to minimize the amount of air travel. Because at the end of the day, one of the main things that I see here, as long as hearing a lot of warm words, is an enormous amount of pollution. And let's be very clear, there is no future if you have the amount of private jets that we have at the moment in this world. That is just not possible to square with having a future for our climate and for our children. Rachel, would you agree with uh, Rupert's analysis of, uh, of Davos? Yeah, I don't disagree with uh, the fact that there has to be systemic behaviour change, and I don't disagree that it's a rarefied atmosphere here of elitism, which is you know, very awkward and uncomfortable, I think. It's also a forum where only just over 20% are women, and that's the highest number they've ever had. So there's something that needs to change in the setup. But I do think what I've seen is a value in having CEOs of different industries sitting together, and for the first time that I've witnessed, having them discuss what are we doing to get to net zero. Net zero or climate was always sort of an uh, the last thing that they would talk about if they talked about it at all. But I was in meetings on the shipping industry, on, uh, you know, on cement and steel and oil and gas. And we've got a long way to go, but the conversation is different. And it's, uh, the starting point is we've got to do this. Now, let's see whether the words turn into action quickly enough. Indeed. And uh, Rachel, just you know, on inequality, Oxfam, uh, their report shows that the world's 2,153 yeah. uh, billionaires have more wealth between them than a combined 4.6 billion people. Um, and many billionaires are there at Davos. Um, you say you see a value of having those CEOs in, in a room. Um, so are we asking them to change a system that they've created, so to speak? Yeah, so, so the capitalism that we have today doesn't serve the planet and it's not serving people. So we have to solve for inclusion and we have to solve for the climate emergency. So, you know, some people believe, therefore, we have to overthrow capitalism. A lot of people believe we have to change the way that we uh, operate capitalism today. I'm in that second camp. Um, I think lots of other people are. And the question, therefore, is... Will the financial sector, which drives performance, start to factor these issues in? Will it measure companies differently? Will it uh, put pressure on? So you've got shareholder and people pressure, and then you've got investor pressure. And that's the conversation that's going on here. Now, will it work or won't it? You know, we can debate that here and elsewhere, but that's the conversation here, that what we've got at the moment is broken. And frankly, I've never had that conversation. I never heard that conversation in the way that I'm hearing it today. Uh, Rupert, you have very strong messages, Extinction uh, Rebellion. I've seen the video of your uh, march on Davos. Um, what would you tell those CEOs? 
Well, I was in a room last night with a, a bunch of CEOs and policymakers, and what I said to them very starkly was, this is an emergency. We've seen all over the world now what happened in Australia in recent weeks. This is something which can affect the most developed countries, the most rich countries, now just as much as it can affect the poor countries. We are all vulnerable and we are all becoming more vulnerable every year that this goes on. Okay. Here at Davos, most people are talking about achieving carbon zero by 2050. But, Ru Rupert, but that is just, just, just to way jump in, too late. Uh, you're telling them, but are they actually getting it? Because... Um, that, that, that there's a huge difference and there was uh, this report by um, uh, PwC that says it's not even climate change is not even on their top 10 list of concerns for CEOs so okay you're telling them but do they get it uh, do mm. they feel that sense of urgency are they seeing those pictures of Australia burning Jakarta flooding that we're talking about every day here as news readers yeah so look, I agree with Rachel that something seems to have shifted and the conversation seems more serious than it has been. But are they getting it enough? No, nowhere near. Because for them to get it enough, they would ramp up their ambitions so much more and they would be pressurizing political leaders so much more than they are doing. If we aim for achieving carbon zero by 2050, that means that this emergency that we are in, and it is an emergency, and we've seen that emergency, as you say, in Indonesia and Australia in recent weeks, that means that this emergency will get worse for the next 30 years at least. Now, when I last looked at the definition of emergency, it didn't say if you're in an emergency, then take action such that in 30 years you'll be able to get out of it. We ought to be operating on a far, far higher level of ambition, the kind of level of ambition that we are talking about in Extinction Rebellion and that our great colleague and supporter Greta Thunberg is talking about. And I would urge people all over the world, I would urge viewers, if you care about your children, if you care about your own life and your own future, if you're not afraid of, of what's going to happen, if you're not sometimes terrified, then you're not paying attention. Mr. Trump is so wrong about this. If you care about the future, please join us because it is civil society movements. It is radical movements like Extinction Rebellion. It is people taking action, ecological action to defend parks, wild spaces all over the world. It is those people, it is us who are changing the story. It is us who are moving the dial so that these CEOs and politicians are at last okay. starting to listen. Rachel, w would you say that in your meetings and you, your career has been, you know, at very high levels uh, with the World Bank, with the UN, you say there's a shift now, they're discussing it, but are they getting it? Is that emergency there? The world is on fire. Uh, is Davos on fire? Uh, no, uh, it's um, smouldering a little bit, I think. So uh, there are CEOs, I think, who do get it um, uh, in the finance sector, in insurance, even in, in the fossil fuel industries, uh, obviously in renewable energy and electricity and food, that in every sector of the economy, there are some who get it. And uh, some are going to manage their way through this transition, some are not. And the ones who, not, who don't, I don't think their companies are going to make it. And so what you're seeing here is CEOs saying, you know, I used to be a hero until last year, and now I'm a zero. You know, I can't go home, my nieces and nephews criticize me at the dinner table. I've heard people say that. I've heard people say, um, you know, the investors are really putting pressure on and this is confusing and we've got to do something different. I've heard CEOs say the opposite. I've said CEOs say, you know, this is just the thing. It's not really serious. So we're spread all around, but there are definitely um, the beginnings of the kinds of shift that we need to see. So I agree with Rupert. The, the pressure has to come from consumers, has to come from individuals. The pressure has to come from investors and those people who help these companies grow and stay in business. And, I mean, I'm a, I'm a dean of a, of a university, a graduate school. My students don't want to go and work for companies that are going to be part of extinction. They want to work for the companies that have got the solutions. Mm -hmm. And so access to talent absolutely is concentrating CEOs' minds at the moment. I want to ask you what happens in you know, life after Davos when you, when everybody leaves that ski resort. Um, how do those commitments, those pledges, actually, you know, transform into something that they can be held accountable for? So they're not just empty words. Um, to, to you, Rupert. Yes. Yeah, so I would say. 
Action and responsibility always begin at home. It's about what we do as individuals. But the most important thing we can do as individuals is join together. The most important thing we can do is take collective action, like the school climate strikers have done, like we have done in Extinction Rebellion. And then we can start to change things. You kindly mentioned in your intro, Maria, my book, This Civilization is Finished. What do I mean by that dramatic title? What I mean is that everything is bound to change. It's either going to change because our society is going to collapse, or it's going to change because we make changes happen intelligently, together, far faster than the current political orthodoxy would have it. And the only way that is going to happen is if there is huge, growing, ongoing pressure from the citizens of the world. It's starting to happen. Let 2020 be the year in which it really, really takes off, and every single viewer can help to make that happen. Rachel, how do we help that happen and how do we keep that uh, measure and enforce accountability when those CEOs leave Davos and go back to their offices? Well, the, the most important individual action, uh, together with everything else, is to vote. We have to have the political leaders that have the courage to sort of say, OK, we're going to become net zero you know, hopefully before 2050, we might not know every step of the way, but we are convinced that our private sector, our civil society and our parliamentary or other system is good enough to get us there. So we need more Meta Fredrikssons, we need more Jacinda Ardern's, we need more like the new Prime Minister of Finland coming and saying we're going to do this. And then I think there are specific partnerships coming out of Davos every year they come out of here. I was in a shipping uh, meeting yesterday um, and we were talking about, you know, uh, people working together. So fuel companies, shipping companies, um, civil society, those who put their products on ships. You know, can we get to the point where within three to four years, we've started to introduce hydrogen or ammonia onto certain ships and we start to st stop talking about what we need to do and actually start doing it. So these kinds of partnerships take uh, they, they move from Davos and, of course, we have climate negotiations in November in Glasgow in Scotland. So there's a lot of people going from here and saying, OK, by the time we get to November, we have to have concrete commitments and we have to see action. and We have to measure ourselves against that. Indeed, uh, and they should be measured. Um, very quickly to you, Rupert, uh, Greta Thunberg says that she will keep repeating numbers until the media and politicians listen. Got 30 seconds. What are you going to keep repeating? I'm going to keep repeating that we are vulnerable. This is not about 2050. This is not about polar bears. This is about you and your family and whether you have a secure future. Let's make it happen. All right, we'll leave it there. Both of you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is a, a fascinating uh, debate and we hope um, next year in Davos we'll have a different uh, message uh, on cli the climate crisis. Uh, my guests, Rachel Kites and Rupert Reid, do stay warm and thank you so much for joining us on The Newsmakers. Bye-bye. Now, following in the footsteps of a man known as, quote, the father of the nation is no easy feat. But that is exactly what Oman's new sultan is now tasked with. Haytham bin Tariq al Said, the former secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and most recently the Minister of National Heritage and Culture, is no stranger to government. Handpicked by the late Sultan Qaboos, Political insiders say Haytham's biggest challenges will be diversifying Oman's oil-rich economy while maintaining friendly relations with his Saudi Arabian, UAE and Iranian neighbours. Now, last week, I was joined in the studio by the director of the Gulf Studies Centre at the University of Qatar, Mahjoub Zawairi, and I began by our discussion by asking him how he would describe the legacy of the former Sultan Qaboos. This is that the man who knows how to move his country from stability to another phase of stability. That is actually the most, the most important legacy of Sultan Qaboos. Explain that a bit more in detail. Because, because basically, you know, and previously we, there are a lot of rumors about there is, you know, he, he has no son. Uh, there is the, the, the constitution itself, they say there is, a, you know, uh, two letters, uh, different places. And so all, there's a lot of rumors, a lot, a lot of, I would say, hidden stories about what will happen if, if he died. And there is a lot of, uh, I would say, concern about it. And the first minute, you know, he, you know, his, his death um, uh, announced, people say, who's the next leader? And people, they assume there will, something wrong will, will go on. 
his, his, his death um, announced at four o'clock. By nine o'clock, we has the new Sultan basically named. So that is a very fast political transition. Okay, uh, and we'll talk about the new Sultan, but, but first of all, um, this was a person that came uh, to, to power when uh, his father had left a country where there was, uh, slavery was still legal, no one could travel abroad, yes. abroad. music was banned. Yeah. And today, Oman is a magnificent country and uh, diplomatically it has done so much that we sometimes don't hear about and doesn't make the international headlines. This go back to three, three, three reasons. One, uh, geopolitics of Oman. Geopolitics of Oman tells us a very important story. This is an open society. This received many, many nations, many nationalities, many ethnics, many religious groups for hundreds of years. And this affects the life of Omanis, the geopolitics, the region. And the most important thing is the, the, the uniqueness of the leadership itself, how to handle politics. Since Sultan Qaboos came to power, he came to power with a very clear message that Oman should be modernized. And how to do this is basically to respect the legacy, the, her the history of Omanis, and move on. And that's what he did, basically. And so we have a, a new Sultan, Haitham bin Tariq al Said. Um, he was the former culture minister. These are big shoes to fill, the ones of Sultan Kabul's. Can he continue in the path that uh, think, Oman has had? I think he's lucky because he's coming after Sultan Qaboos. This is a challenge for him to prove himself as a leader. And as you said, to, to fill the shoes. That's important because, you know, let's not forget, the 50 years being in power, there's a lot of things being done. So what he can do now? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very stable, modernized country. I think he has to do, uh, he, he has facing three things. One, maintaining what Sultan Qaboos has done and build on that. That's an important step. Secondly, he has to maintain that, you know, he, Oman, he live, Oman in a very dynamic region, very unstable region. Especially has, now, the especially timing, now. incredible. And, 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 and he played an important role to stabilize the region at some stage. And this Oman now has to maintain that role if, if we assume that he will follow the same step. And the third more important thing is the economic challenge. Oman has to look at this economic situation. And, and talk to us about that, because um, according to the uh, ILO, there was um, unemployment was nearly 50% two years ago, especially youth unemployment. Yeah. You remember 2011, there was demonstration in, in the context of Arab Spring in, in yes. some cities in Oman. There was a criticism to the corruption and, and calling for uh, reform uh, uh, and, and uh, fighting uh, employment. Um, that's the reason, actually, um, uh, Sultan Haytham uh, was in charge of the vision of Oman 2040. And he was basically leading a group of international and Omani uh, uh, experts to put together the document which basically now uh, started. And the most important thing in this, in this uh, uh, document, three things. One is basically uh, the governance uh, inside uh, the governance and, and uh, uh, basically um, tackling the uh, uh, economic situation and the diversification of the economy. And the third element is basically um, uh, building the human capacity of Omanis and make them more competent uh, in, 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 the, in the modern world. Okay. And internationally, foreign policy-wise, Oman seems is fascinating because it's been involved in so many uh, big diplomatic spats, but it doesn't make the headlines. Uh, for, exa for example, um, hosting uh, the U.S. or being in between uh, Iran and the U.S. Yes. for the uh, JCPOA 2015 yeah. Iran deal. Um, we know Benjamin Netanyahu was there. It's, yes. it's hosted uh, Yemen's Houthi rebels. So much, but secretly, why? In 2008, there was an interview with Sultan Qaboos in Al-Qabas in a, in a, in a, in a newspaper in Kuwait. And he was asked, similar to this question, his answer was the following. We have differences with others. However, we don't add uh, oil to the fire. Indeed. And, and that is, to me, a very clear that if, if there are differences with others, they have differences with Saudi Arabia, they have differences with other Emirates, but they are not put, putting oil on that fire. They try to manage it. They try to do de-escalate de things. And I think that's what they do, basically. They believe in two, in, in two things. One, stabilization is, is, is benefit for everyone. And more important thing, we are share of geopolitics, which will never can change. Even now, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, given what has happened in January 2020 already, yes. will Oman uh, keep in that neutral path? I think, I think they will continue. Um, uh, I think uh, they, they will have this role um, uh, because they are trusted from both sides. 
Um, I, I see them working with, with the Qataris on that path in a way or other to calm down the situation uh, in the Gulf region. Because it really is a very interesting time and to have a new uh, leader in Oman at this time. Um, very interesting indeed. And, and just very quickly, how important would you say Oman is to the West? Very important. Um, we know that it's very important to the British. Uh, if you look at the leaders who went just to Oman to, sh uh, to basically uh, to pay condolence to, to the, to the, lead, the new leader, this tells you how much is important. Uh, you know, leaders from across the globe, uh, they came in the, in the three days just uh, uh, in Oman. And, um, and that's, to me, an, an important indicator that the, the West, the world, want Oman to be stable, want Oman to be a, a very uh, important country and leading stability in the region. Thanks so much for your company. See you next time. Bye-bye from me, Maria Ramos. Bye.